Hi, everybody. Thomas Brinsko here, president and publisher of BIC Magazine and BICMagazine.com. And I'm super excited to be talking to uh, an old friend and business associate of mine, uh, Chet Thompson, who you probably know already is the president and CEO of AFPM. Uh, he took on that role about seven or eight years ago. I remember it well. Uh, and he's done a great job for uh, our industry. Uh, before that, he was a lawyer for a couple of decades. Don't hold that against him. It actually is really good uh, background. He worked with the uh, George W. Bush administration and, and their EPA. And uh, I'm super glad to have him here and talk a little bit about some of the changing landscape we're seeing for the uh, petrochemical business and the refining business in particular. Uh, welcome, Chet. Thank you for being here. Thomas, thanks, thanks for having me. It's always a, a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, I love your magazine. I love your coverage and your support. So thanks for having me. Yep. You're, and you're uh, dialing in from Washington, D.C. today, right? I am indeed. All right. And I'm down in the Houston, Texas area. We were just having a little offline discussion about some of the differences we're seeing right now. But I wanted to kind of maybe start a conversation about uh, Washington, D.C. in particular. And you know, the Biden administration, uh, by all accounts, you know, they've moved very uh, quickly and aggressively in their first uh, month or so in office on a number of issues, including climate. Uh, Chet, can you talk to us a little bit about the new political landscape and its potential impacts on the downstream sector? Sure. Uh, welcome uh, the question. And you know, there's there's a saying that that politicians love to, uh, to say, Thomas, that elections matter, elections have consequences, and uh, this one was no exception. Uh, there are big changes here in Washington, as I'm sure all your viewers know, but you know we have a new president, uh, we have a new Senate, and so we now have Democrats controlling you know, all the levers of, of government. And so you know, there's certainly a different feel and philosophy of this administration than the prior administration. Uh, that was been clear from both the lead up to the inauguration and uh, and since you know day one of the inauguration, and they're coming in with uh, again a, a, a different attitude towards the fossil fuel industry, one that they're focusing on climate and you know an acceleration of a of a of the transition as they like to call it, and again we saw this on, on day one Thomas from the decision to. Uh, rescind the Keystone XL pipeline, the decision to join the Paris Accord. Uh, a couple uh, weeks ago, we saw the reestablishment of the social cost of carbon and, you know, a, a whole new re-regulatory uh, focus. So, you know, while I think it's pretty clear to all of us that, you know, that would be a, a bit of a more challenging time for our industry than, than the last four years might have been, but the good news is, is that we're, we're prepared for it. And, and most importantly, I really do think that we are uh, situated to have a really professional, uh, thoughtful relationship with the new administration. We know lots of folks that are, um, you know, in the Biden administration. I think we're going to work with them, you know, very well. And so, I, but I look at this in terms of what the regulatory agenda, what the legislative agenda, and, and even then what the Biden executive agenda is. And from a regulatory standpoint, again, the big thing you're going to see and you've already seen out of EPA is they're going to reevaluate all of the prior administration's uh, decisions to deregulate. So you're going to see that and we've already seen it. In fact, they announced that basically every rule is going to be revisited. So some of the ones that you can imagine that we're focused on and we're watching closely what happens with the NEPA reforms, uh, uh, permitting generally, we care a lot about that. Uh, we're hoping to convince them that a lot of these these reforms in the prior administration were really good, you know. Uh, our, our position is we want to set set the rules. We're all prepared to live by the rules, but let's set them and then let's make them, you know, work efficiently. We we need projects and we need to be able to, you know, to progress, uh, you know, fairly. The the other rules certainly the renewable fuel standard. I can't give an interview without talking about the RFS. This new administration's coming in at a time where. Uh, we don't even have an RFS uh, regulation for 2021. Mm -hmm. And so I'll be sending a letter today to uh, the new administrator, Regan, both wishing him well and encouraging him 
and reminding him of the importance of getting on uh, with those efforts in the RFS. And then finally, we'll, we'll be watching very closely what the new administration does with CAFE, the standards to regulate new automobiles. As you can imagine, we care a lot about that and we weigh in on that in terms of our own efforts, you know, related to, you know, higher octane fuels. And so we'll, we'll be watching that closely. And then legislatively, a lot of talk of what's going to happen. You've seen, everyone has seen that Congress's focus over the last few weeks has been on COVID relief. You know, we agree uh, with that in terms of that needing to be a focus because, you know, our industry is going to play a big role in that. That's something we've been talking with the president about that if you want the economy to come back, uh, we're a big part of that. We, we fuel yeah. the economy. We have 3 million voters. And, but I'll say this legislatively, I, I do think in the next month, a couple months will be a lot of focus on infrastructure projects. But other than that, I think some of the bigger things yeah. that we're talking about are going to be hard to do with the divided Congress. It's just really going to be hard. Um, on the RFS, I saw on the AFPM website uh, a week or two ago that uh, Jeff Moody from your staff had posted a blog. A blog and if uh, any of our uh, listeners and uh, readers are interested in that, uh, they can go to AFPM.org or uh, Pick Magazine. We'll have a link to it from our website as well. Yeah, That's thanks for that great. shout out. You know, we have certainly have been you know, highlighting the, uh, the, you know, the great importance of this program and, you know, the, frankly, the, 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 uh, the difficulties that, that is, uh, has created for our industry. And you know that very well, and you write about it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for doing that. But uh, yeah, go to there. It's a great source of info on our website. Hey, uh, let's move on to another current topic. I was actually having breakfast with a couple guys from industry this morning, and the topic of ESG came up and how this uh, fellow's uh, business, I'm going to let him remain nameless, uh, we're looking at these issues and uh, dealing with them. Uh, zooming in a little bit on that, even the topic of sustainability is becoming so increasingly relevant across all sectors of the United States economy. Uh, how important is uh, sustainability to the refining and uh, petrochemical industries and how is AFPM helping its constituents take on this issue? Well, thanks, Thomas, for that question. You know, as, uh, as someone, you said I practice law. To be more specific, I, I practice environmental law. And, and as you mentioned, I was at EPA for several years. And so, you know, sustainability is important to me personally. Uh, you know, reducing our environmental uh, footprint is important. But you know, it's really important to the industry. And this is, I know, uh, you know, uh, something that I share with our members. We talk about it all the time. In fact, when we talk about our mission, you know, our mission is to provide the fuels and petrochemicals that a growing world, growing population, growing economies need to thrive. And make but progress we, possible. We make progress <laughs> possible, but, you know, but we also know that we have to deliver those products in a sustainable way. And that's why I take great pleasure pointing out that over the last couple of decades, our, our emissions of criteria pollutants are down about 60%. I saw the other day that our carbon intensity is down about 12% uh, over the last decade, even though refining capacity and pet chem capacity is up. Uh, we're making huge strides in terms of uh, looking for ways to, you know, to help with renewable fuels. We're investing and algae-based fuels, renewable diesel. I'm sure we'll talk about yeah. that. Yeah. So, so we're doing a lot and it's really important. In fact, two other things I'll say if you go to AFPM's website. One, Thomas, just a few weeks ago, we, we published our first ever AFPM sustainability report. And the, and the point of that is basically, you know, we went out and we looked at all the things that our members are doing in the name of sustainability. And they're great. There's tremendous things we're doing. And we pulled that together in a report because we really think the public, you know, needs to know more about what we're doing. And, and that's there. And, and one plug for us, you know, for us next month, you may know, is our annual meeting, which is moving forward. And we're having a full ESNG panel discussion. I'm bringing ESNG experts from Wall Street, institutional investors to give us their take of ESNG. So I can tell you on behalf of all of our members that sustainability is incredibly important to us. Yeah. For everybody listening, the annual meeting for AFPM has been the must attend event of the year. Uh, this year, it's going to be um, all virtual. So uh, you have no uh, travel expense and you'll be able to just dial right in. It's going to be uh, April 12th and 13th. So check your calendars and then log on to AFPM's website and check that out. Yeah, thank you for that, Thomas. Hey, uh, uh, regarding uh, sustainability, 
Man, I'm, I'm seeing our reporters at Vic. We're just covering, it seems like uh, the whole plastic waste in the circular economy mm -hmm. thing real quick. We just 30 seconds or a minute. Touch, touch on that for me on uh, how that comes about in uh, sustainability for our industry. Well, look, you know, again, sustainability on, on the side of my, our pet chem members that we proudly represent, uh, you know, we have long recognized that, you know, that, that plastic waste, the mismanagement of plastic waste is, is unacceptable. And that in order for us to continue to thrive, in order for us to continue to, to meet the, the demand for pet chem that we know the, the growing world population needs that, you know, we need, we as a, as a, as a people, we need to address uh, plastic waste and we need to make sure that it is better managed. We need to make sure that it is recycled better. And, and I'm, I'm excited to tell you that our members are 100% behind this, you know, from supporting groups like the Alliance to End Plastic Waste to a great research and development into more chemical recycling. You know, we, there's been historically a lot of mechanical recycling and now we're moving into chemical recycling. And, uh, and members of ours like CP Chem and Enios and Dow, they've made fantastic advancements in this regard over the last couple of years. And so, again, it's something that our members are committed to. And, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're standing by to work with anyone who wants to work with us to, to try to get our arms around this important issue. You, you mentioned also uh, the uh, renewable diesel plants you know yeah. we're seeing some new facilities being built but uh, kind of more shocking to my conscience is that uh, we're closing down traditional crude refineries and converting them into renewable diesel refineries what impact does that have on uh, your organization and, and and what are your thoughts generally what's driving this and uh, is it going to be good for uh, employment and our industry well again you know a great question. Um, you know, what I'll just say is that change is upon us. You know, we we feel it. it it's uh, it's there. I mean, it's always there. But, you know, this last year has shown a lot more investment in renewable diesel. And, you know, that well, that's in response to several things. That One, that's in response to greater consumer demand for renewable fuels. And our members want to be there to supply that and meet that demand. And you know, certainly there's some regulatory programs like the California Low Carbon Fuel Standards and Renewable Fuel Standards that also incentivize more renewable diesel. So you know, there's been I think we're about just south of a, a million gallons a year of renewable diesel capacity right now. We're expecting that to quadruple in the next five years, and I think that's a good thing. Again, it's you know, it's a it's a product that can be made using uh, our existing plants and largely a lot of our existing units. And so, you know, the demand is there and our members want to meet it. So as far as it, you know, how's it going to impact uh, AFPM? You know, as long as my members are, are keeping their facilities up and, and producing liquid fuels, uh, I'm hoping it will be a, you know, a net positive for, for AFPM. I use an analogy describing businesses all the time as being organic, you know, and even my own company that we've been around since 84, it's like you have to prune off the branches that aren't producing fruit and you just water and feed the, the parts of the plant that are producing that return for you. And yeah. uh, you got to try new things and uh, the business won't be the same. If you're not changing and growing, you're probably dying. And so uh, yeah, that's right. And look, some of, some of these, you know, facilities, and you need to talk, and um, you have spoken to a lot of the facilities directly. They all have their different reasons for doing it. But, you know, some of these facilities might have, you know, closed permanently, right? but for their ability to convert. So I would take a converted renew renewable diesel plant over a shuttered plant every day of the week. Amen. Amen, brother. Uh, well, look, um, you said changes upon us, and I think that's a great summary of it. You know, uh, I hope that changes upon us by any measure. 2020 was a uh, heck of a tough year, particularly for the energy sector. Uh, I can't let you leave without asking such a broad question because everybody probably asked it of you anyway. What is your outlook really for 2021 as a whole and uh, projects that we might see and thoughts generally about the future? Well, you're, let me just say, you know, 2020 was a, a challenging year, but I am really proud of my members because they rose up and, and met that challenge. 
you know, I like to remind people here in Washington uh, that our, our industry and our workforce, our incredible workforce, the men and women, you know, that, that, that work in our industry, they didn't, you know, they weren't able to quarantine. They weren't able to work from home. They kept our facilities up and running. They kept our, you know, the gas moving and uh, they, they really, they, they kept our first responders going. Our pet chem guys converted straight away and all this personal protective equipment that has now become commonplace, it wouldn't be possible without our product. So thank you to the men and women of our industry. Uh, tough year, but I'm really optimistic about 2021. We're, we're you know, there's, there was nothing fundamentally wrong with our industry that caused this, you know, massive demand destruction. It was and is uh, COVID-19. And now that we seem to be getting, turning the corner on that, seeing great states like Texas reopen and other states following suit, we're optimistic that that's gonna happen. And as that happens, you've seen it, you know, demand is going back up. I saw that last week, you know, gasoline demand was around 9 million barrels a day, um, you know, off from last year, but only slightly off. Diesel demand is, is increasing. And we think that's gonna keep upticking you know, in the months ahead, as you know, we get more and more of the country vaccinated as we get into the summer driving season. And, you know, longer term, uh, whether it be IEA or EIA or whatever, you know, acronym you want to use looking at the data, the data tells us that the demand long term for fossil fuels and pet chem remains strong and our members are going to be there to meet that demand. That's been a theme that I've seen certainly over the macro lens. If you zoom out 15, 20 years, COVID is going to be a blip in the upward trajectory of our global need for fuel. So uh, God bless all of our members and keep at it and uh, let's uh, help make progress possible. Uh, Chad, I, I really thank you so much for joining us today. I know how busy you are, but I hope you agree to join us again and let's uh, revisit some of these issues a few months down the road. Until then, I'll see you at the virtually at the annual meeting. Thanks, Thomas. And again, thank you for all you do for the ind industry. Uh, everyone loves your publication and you do, you do great work. So thank you so much for your commitment and I hope to see you next month. All right. And for all of our listeners and readers, if you're not, uh, following Bic Magazine already on LinkedIn and Twitter, or you'd like to get our weekly newsletter, please go to BicMagazine.com and sign up and you can uh, stay in the know. God bless. We'll talk to you soon.